What's going on, people? This is another installment of the film review. Movies, music, culture, and whatever else comes to our minds. I'm Crazy Day. Tracy. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, we're here on a uh, very unusual day uh, in uh, black history. We are uh, missing uh, a departed queen from our midst, Aretha Franklin. Um, you know, what's funny about Aretha Franklin, well, it's not really funny, but it's, it's true, is that because she came into our households, I know, especially being of a certain age and the parents, our parents, uh, growing up on listening to Aretha Franklin and then, or experiencing Aretha Franklin and then thus, we grew up listening to Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin seems like a family member. You know, a family member that you may not have met but you see on TV and you hear in the music because the 45s and the albums play on your uh, phonograph, so um, on your record player, so you heard her all the time. Uh, one of my moms, who is now who has passed on, uh, one of her favorite songs was uh, "Midnight Train to Georgia" uh, by Aretha Franklin. That, that played quite Good often. Night. Oh, excuse me. That is last night. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm getting uh, people confused. Why is everybody doing that? Somebody else did that earlier today. You know, respect. R e s p e c t. It's one of those um, popular songs that my mother used to play. And um, you know, so it's 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 not so much. To me, and we'll see what you think, but not, not so much to me that it's a sad occasion, but an occasion to rejoice because she lived a nice, successful life, you know, plus she was instrumental in being the soundtrack, one of the soundtracks to the civil rights movement being involved in the civil rights movement and always being a positive uh, transforming presence <coughs> on the scene within soul music within pop music within R&B music so you know one of, one of the ones that I remember as well as like she has like a, a catalog of work that's just like out of this world um her body of work is just just goes on and on and on and um throughout the decades her footprint is um she touched every decade and she will definitely definitely be missed because she Um, involved because he had uh, uh, some type of um, function going on at night and um, she really wanted to be there she wanted to lend her voice out um, she was touched um, she sang um, she wanted to be a part of what was going on because she saw what was going on in this country and the many lives that were taken you know, by young men murdered in this country. And um, and just like she had throughout the years, 
and she played a part of the civil rights movement up until she passed she was involved that's right um, she will definitely definitely be missed she was more than an artist she was a human being who loved the people who she sang to and she was just a great human being and she cared for those who cared for her the people who purchased her music and loved her in return she loved them and what was funny is she didn't do music to try to be a pop star. Right. She did music that she felt, you know, that she felt. And so it wasn't like, um, it wasn't contrived or phony or uh, anything like that. It was straightforward uh, music that moved people. Now, you know, you know, it's funny um, about the civil rights situation. You know, I was uh, watching uh, one of our people who uh, watch us, which uh, what I'm doing is uh, connecting with people on uh, the Internet, uh, sharing this piece right now. Um, there is a mindset as far as the civil rights movement is concerned uh which is anti-civil rights and, and this, this is what i'm talking about uh one of our people rodney smith who uh listens to us and you've seen him on uh black book as well as like it is radio and nothing but the facts podcast um he posted a conservative's viewpoint on uh, Donald Trump and talking about using the word. I don't say, I don't, uh, we're gonna drop that N word and start dealing with it and calling it the word. Uh, using the word uh, to, you know, uh, degrade or uh, put an aspersion on black people. And he was talking about it in this piece and he was saying that, you know, he said that there's no one that's uh, above the, there's no one unless you're under the age of 10 that hasn't used the word, uh, especially uh, with, uh, as far as concern, as far as the hip hop is concerned. As soon as he said, well, he said rap music, he didn't say hip hop. But as soon as he said that, that just totally disqualified him in my eyes. Uh, and, I, and I cut off from it because everyone always <coughs> wants to, well, some people, people who are on that side who are pro-conservative, pro-Republican, and in this case now pro-Donald Trump, uh, they are, uh, and who are black, they seem to talk this argument that black people that were, who wanted to keep the status quo starting all the way back, because there's always been a struggle all the way through ever since 1865. There's been a struggle. There was the nay dare for 100 years, then it turned into 1965, right? So you go do that research. Um, I have videos up about that on my Crazon Dion page. You just have to search them out because they're kind of buried on YouTube because that's my earlier information. It's my foundation. But there's a um, argument that comes from that strength. Sometimes people don't extrapolate out and they don't follow the train of thought that they come from because they think that what they're doing or what they're saying is new. Right, that it's no, there's no train of thought or no through line in the story or the history to go back to and say, hey, you know, this is what we believed, but uh, it may have been wrong. So take this, the the guy who was talking that, my opinion, my opinion, he's in the same through line of people who were against Martin Luther King, who were black, who believed that civil rights was wrong and that we as black people should just get along and not stir up any trouble. And one day 
if we just work hard enough, if we just such a la di da di da di da di da that uh, then we would get our rightful place, that we shouldn't fight, that we should just uh, remain, uh, just take what came to us. That is that same through line, and if those people's thought process had succeeded, we wouldn't be here right now talking to you. There wouldn't be people who have uh, black businesses, like his business is in a white neighborhood. It's basically owned by a white, it, it, the, the shopping plaza is owned by a white corporation and he has a business within that white area and he wouldn't be there if that train of thought had won out. You know what I mean? Well, that's the easy go-to for some people. They want to blame rap music and then they say, well, what about the black-on-black violence? And and uh, instead of focusing on what the real issues are, which is um, racist society and what's going on with the you know alt right and white supremacy, and maybe focusing on focusing on that and what's going on and and an unfairness, and so it's easy to say. You know, oh, let's blame the rappers or, you know. And the reason why I mentioned that is because during the time when Martin Luther King was pushing, when Malcolm was pushing, when Megger Evers was pushing, and the countless unnamed men and women within the civil rights and within the struggle. Right, there were some black for people independence. against him. Right. right. It, it, all during that time, there were people who were black who listened and spoke right. the words of those who did not want to see right. black people liberated and would call them race baiters. Right. And the reason why I bring this up is because um, because Al Sharpton was on talking right. and he was speaking about how Aretha Franklin, what you referenced earlier, how Aretha, Aretha Franklin came out to uh, his event because he, she right. wanted to be involved right. because it was wrong for what them happened? to yeah. choke out and murder yeah. Eric right. Garner yeah. and nothing uh, nothing is really right. done about it and they're murdering right. uh, young and old men and women right. children and uh, 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 children right. uh, uh, girls and boys right. right and instead of focusing on that they'll say what about that black on black? <laughs> right, and so that that that's my point of what I'm saying that right. she as a as a person who was not only a soul singer, right. a pop singer, she but also she was a she was active in the struggle right. to end white supremacy and racism, right. and she saw Al Sharpton not as a race baiter, right. but as a person that's in the through line. Right of all of the preachers and the right. pastors who have come before yeah. who are in the struggle to end white supremacy and racism mm -hmm. and have black people have their rightful place mm -hmm. in this society that she people wasn't, yeah just an entertainer she yeah she she was there so that's you know that's uh connecting i like to connect dots and i like to connect through lines yeah. so when you hear people and they're talking about, uh, well, Al Sharpton is a race baiter, right. or they blame rap music right. or hip hop music for the N word, for right. the word. I don't, not the N word. We're gonna put that out there because someone right. phrased, coined that. I'm gonna say <coughs> the word. Uh, when they blame uh, rap music or hip hop right. music for the word, first of all, the hip hop uh, and the rappers didn't create the word. They didn't create it. So someone created it that that same person is uh, with the through line of let's not rock the boat. Let's not worry about civil rights are the same ones who will blame it or somehow just like back then, they would say somehow it was our defici deficiency right. while they were lynching us, right. while they were 
burning us, right. while they were raping us. It was our deficiency. It's the same through line. Right. And you bring it up to the day, okay, well, Donald Trump can't be held accountable right. for using the N-word because, hey, hip-hop uses the N-word. Right. So, you know, he can't be held accountable for that. Right. That is the same uh, same through line, mush mouth um, mess right. that if if they had succeeded, we wouldn't be where we are today within uh, struggling. So, you know, that's what I want to uh, definitely get across about that. Yeah, and there's no such thing as uh, black on black crime. And there's no there's such thing. No, no matter where you live, if you're in a predominantly white area, they don't say it's white on white crime. Though, though it really is. I mean, if you yeah, want to so be truthful. It depends. I mean, crime <laughs> is crime, and it doesn't matter where you are, and it's going to be predominantly whatever culture it is, or, you know, so this whole, it's just like a, a diversion. So instead of focusing on the issues and what's going on today and all this craziness and people calling the police on children selling water or lemonade or hot dogs or I mean it's just like it's just you know we need to focus on more important things. No 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 wait a minute wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. just just to get just to be on a little just to get a little ignorant for a minute. Did any of you people see the video now, now this, now this white kid, he's a white man. I'm just saying a kid though, but he's not a kid. He's grown. He has these long cornrows in the car, and they they have the camera. The camera's going, and then he sees two young black males, right. two young black men, uh, young black boys. They were right. boys. They were young teenagers. Yeah. They're young. They're not men. They're still teenagers. They are boys still. So they turn 18. Minding they, their own business. Minding their own business. <laughs> trying to sell lemonade right. on the corner. Selling lemonade on the corner. Right. And the person who's holding the camera says to the, the guy says, pull up, pull up. He said, he say, do you have any money? Now he's the passenger. The guy who tells the other guy who's holding the camera says, who says, pull up, pull up. He's the passenger. He would be what TLC was saying their song about the person always yelling out the window that's the passenger side that's right. basically broke right. all right so the guy who's holding the camera says do you have any <coughs> money because he didn't know what he was gonna do right. so he was holding the camera i don't know if it, or maybe he did or didn't or but he was like do you have any money because it didn't make any sense so he so he pulls up and he says so the guy pulls up and he s slows down and he stops and then the guy in the passenger seat says uh do you guys have a permit to uh, sell lemonade? Because if not, I'm going to have to call the police on you. Right. And the dude walks around. He doesn't say anything. It just cold, cold bitch slaps. Bitch slaps the dude. Right. And then the video cuts off. Right. You know, I know it's, it's, it's kind of a shocker because they used to... Uh, black people believe in the stereotypes that back in the 60s or something we were somehow dormant and we weren't out there uh, raising raising cane <laughs> when when uh, when different things would take place against us so you know I just had to get in there have you seen that video because it is truly hilarious and it's just crazy all of this craziness harassing people and I mean the truth is these are racist people who these particular people they're just racist people who are taking the opportunity to pick up the phone and harass a black person so it's it it's make it makes no sense but, but it's American history so we need to just uh focus on what we need to focus on which is keep doing what we're doing keep taking care of your families keep getting the education keep starting businesses support one another's businesses that's right um and stay focused because the main the main the main determination 
determining factor if, if you have self-hate or not is if you if none of your dollars right. ever go to black owned businesses and you feel somehow that the business owned by a Caucasian or the business owned by an Asian or the business owned by Arabs are somehow better than the business uh, the businesses owned by the people who look like you. If you if you have a problem with people who look like you, then you really don't love yourself. If you have a problem with shopping with people who look like you, then you really don't love yourself. And if you if you're constantly saying, well, what about that black on black crime? <laughs> I mean, crime is everywhere. You just watch the ID channel. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. I mean, so. Listen, listen. Watch the ID (laughs) channel and the different shows that are on. You will, you will walk out the house and be looking at every (laughs) Caucasian that you can see because the majority of stories, if these stories were shown on the news, like how they have the anti-black machine rolling every night on different newscasts where they show you uh, nothing but black people doing crime to keep the stereotype going. If they started showing you really <coughs> what was happening, you you would say, man, these people are psychotic. They're murderous. And, you know, it's just ridiculous. The reason why, you know, the reason why uh, I speak on this is because of the fact that like Aretha Franklin, and, and many soul singers like her and the various people who they consider quote unquote activists. Hey Franklin, he said and, uh, quote unquote activists and uh, everything. I am in the fight to end white supremacy racism. Period. So that's why we address these topics like this and why Aretha Franklin brings that up because she was in the heat of it now. The newest thing, I've been seeing this built for the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Now that hip hop music, since we're staying on that, now that hip hop music has become, uh, did y'all eat yet? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, Franklin. Um, being the hip hop music is now a, a billion dollar business, more than a billion dollars. It's gonna be a gazillion dollars in a minute globally worldwide something that started in the Bronx right right? Uh, some people say 73 but most definitely uh, 76 79 you know everything Uh, we we, like I've told you before we had a Curtis Blow interview that was conducted by myself and Franklin G that's up Um, ever since that has become a billion dollar business and somehow uh, the Caucasian record company owners and the Jewish record company owners who have always owned that the first million uh, the first uh, million dollar selling record was Betsy Smith and when they, when they called it race record she was the first one ever since they got a hold of it they have pumped a certain image right and but people who know what hip hop is Hip hop comes from uh, New York, California, uh, the South, Midwest, all of those different areas have their own brand of hip hop. People who know hip hop, what hip hop is, they understand. And when it goes around globally, there are different hip hop communities around the world that do and tell their stories. It's about telling your story. And like Chuck D said, it was the black people CNN. And it still is, because it tells the story of what's happening in the neighborhoods and everything. Ever since that has happened, there has been a push to try to criminalize. They've always criminalized uh, the black man and the uh, black, uh, black, boy uh they've all and now since then they criminalized the black woman and the black girl they criminalized them too so they've made black bodies something to fear 
and feel as if that is something to be leery of. Now, the reason why I bring this up and why there is a fight to end white supremacy racism, uh, you know, all white folks that are not in the battle to end white supremacy racism who have not uh, studied, who have not fought to uh, or or in some kind of uh, progressive movement. I don't even like using that word because within the progressive, there are white supremacists and racists too. But for those people who have not been in the struggle, they are part of the problem. They are part of a problem. We have an inner struggle going on to push out and get us out of the fictitious uh, well, not the fictitious, but the environment they have purposely put us in to try to get us to wipe each other out, which were ghettos, which they, which the Germans implemented on the Jews first, on Jewish people first in Germany, and they fell for it, and a lot of them was killing. Then they gave the excuse to be able to take them to the concentration camps and to start to exterminate them. Now, that, now that's history you can go back there and read that that's the way that is okay now we were coming out of the theater and you know I was watching my wife go down to the restroom before I went into the uh, men's room because you have to protect your wife at all times protect your woman at all times and women protect their men at all times right but being that you're the man you're going to protect and make sure that your woman gets to her destination without problem so i was standing there and then this young caucasian couple are walking down now i'm standing there now there's the theater now we came from out of our theater and i'm standing there waiting for her to go down and this young caucasian couple are walking down and the both of them pause for a minute now i'm standing there minding my own business watching my wife walk down to the uh, restroom they pause for a minute and then they they look leery like what's going on uh, we're in the movie we're in the movie uh complex right and so then they walk and so the girl decides that she's gonna walk on and she walks past me to go in and he's all sheepish when actually he should have led the way and opened the door for his lady and had her go in. He should have led the way. How cowardly are some Caucasian men? How cowardly? I'm not going to say all. Yeah, not all. Just not all, it's but a, I'm, a, it's a mental racism. It, is definitely a mental illness. It's a mental illness. How cowardly are you that a person is standing there, minding their own business, watching someone else go down not even making eye contact with you because like I tell people all the time I don't see white people but I have to I don't see white people until we go out and have to do things because mostly I'm around my people so but when I'm out I see him and I have to watch because just like that here he is I'm standing there minding my own business watching my wife go down there and he's leery now this is the same person that will go join the police force and then say that they are afraid of a black male. I stand six foot four, 230, and they will stand there and say that they are afraid. And I was doing nothing but minding my own business. This is the same people. Or you get the white person, which is just like the, they're, they're in fear and they overcompensate for their fear. And they get brutal. Now that can be some of the people who are joining these uh, white nationalist groups and all that. And they get also brutal, brutal, or they infiltrate the police force and and then say, "Oh, we need to go in and be forceful on people. You can't just communicate because you've been uh, you've been uh, sh uh, shot a, a bill of goods about a group of people." Which, you know, we used to have a slogan back in the 90s. It's a black thing. You don't have to understand. Right. right? And, you know, they take our slogans. And, you know, this is just me observing. They take our slogans and they flip it on us. 
as the generations change, as the generations change and and we forget because we don't store our history, they flip yeah. it on us and then make it something, well, you said we didn't have to understand, so that's why we kill you. Because yeah, you but you know understand. what, for instance, well, there was a scene in the movie and we're going to go into the film. Okay. We went to see uh, The Spy Who Dumped Me, which was a funny, funny, funny film. Um, starring Mila Coolis and Kate McKinnon. And it was just hilarious. So there was a scene in the film, and I had to get a movie away. When uh, they pull out their guns, and they're in another country. And the guy who they put their guns on... Um, he, He's a heavy set. Yeah, the first Euro one, yeah pen. European, uh, European um, white male, and the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, "You guys must be Americans," because he enters the room and there's like three guns on him, and then so I mean it's just so sad that the stereotype is coward, just just being cowardly. You know, Americans are cowardly. Um, well, white Americans. Guns, guns, guns. You know, uh, don't ask questions, just shoot. Like what's going, you know, like what's going on now, as well as in the past. Um, so the first thing to do is pull out a gun. Because the first thing is a fear reaction. Instead of seeing another person as just a human being. Because believe me, me and the majority of people I know, everyone is just living their day to day life. Nobody's picking up the phone. I've driven down the street and I've seen people selling this and selling that and, and I've this who sell lemonade and 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 because a child is a child. A child but is all a child. of this craziness about picking up your cell phone because you see a little black girl, a little black boy, and I mean it's just like a mental illness. And then the sad thing about it is what these people don't realize is people are seeing you all around the world like this craziness this this walking around with the tiki torches and and this the, the racist chants you know against the blacks and jews and mexicans and like people are looking at you and then to see it in a film you must be americans i mean it, it's just crazy so it's it's so cowardly to hide behind a gun and it's so cowardly and and crazy because that shows you're a racist. A person that's minding their own business, walking in the movie theater, and you see a black person and you automatically freeze. Like, how crazy? Like, that is like literally, that is mental illness. And, and, but it's not mental illness that you can uh, get an excuse for well, being mentally excuse. ill. It's not an excuse. It's crazy. I mean, it's you crazy. know, you need to, you would think those people would check themselves because it's not normal. No, you know, man. because you see other, you know, black people, you see other white people as well, uh, Mexicans, Asians, whoever, you know, and they're minding their business and everyone is just, doesn't matter if you're in the grocery store or in the bank, minding their own business and they're acting like human beings. But every now and then, you'll find, run across one that has this rude, racist attitude. And then so it's just like, okay. You mentally ill. Like, what is wrong with you? And then the, the funny thing about it is, it's just like they think it's just so cool and to 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 be a neo Nazi and to to say they're a, you know a Trump supporter and and uh, and to to scream all these uh, n racist words and to down other groups. But it's not it's not cool. It's like everyone around the world is like looking at you like you freaking idiot and it, it makes them as Americans look bad because I mean there are so many stories of people who when they travel to other countries and other people make comments about Americans like it's just crazy the, so the, they the, only the, make the, themselves the, look the, bad the problem with the, uh, with the system the education system is they teach uh, American exceptionalism but they don't teach the Caucasian Americans how to be exceptional 
They know nothing about geography. They know nothing about the real history. They Everything is always from the beginning, from when the first invaders came over and uh, Dr. Uh, James, I mean, Professor James Small talks about this. We interviewed him, you should go see it. When the first time the first invaders came and saw what, what people in Africa had and were living in peace and started to destroy, it's always been a cover up. It's always a cover up. No, we're not doing that. They're the savages. It's always a cover up. And so it's been a cover up so they don't know the true history and they're sitting around not knowing the true history, not knowing geography, not knowing weather, believing that uh, global warming is not happening. Meanwhile, the world is going to crap in a handbasket. And then when, when the time came for them to be, to show that they had learned something from the struggles from the 60s, they failed <coughs> miserably when President Obama was in office. They failed miserably because President Obama was not black people's savior. He came from out of the black tradition, but he was, like Martin Luther King, was not a savior for black people. He was fighting to make sure that we weren't getting our heads beat, but he was saving their souls because believe me there is no forgiveness for doing the dirt that has been done to us there is no forgiveness for that you can believe uh, you can believe what you want but there is no forgiveness for doing the type of dirt that uh, you have done so speaking of Aretha Franklin that brings that up because she was such a strong force she was a, such a strong force, and I'll say that again. She was such a strong force, along with people like James Brown, Otis Redding, these people who were pushing black is beautiful. And through every reinvention of herself, different styles from when she started all the way up to now her passing, she has always been a beautiful representation of us. And so that's why uh, this discussion comes up. And, you know, it's, um, we can talk more about it, but we have to get on the film now. But we wanted to give that particular <coughs> tribute because we have not heard that, that aspect of her as a person who used the music and used her presence as a person who brought about change and the betterment of this society through her music because treating black people poorly makes the society nothing but coming and and giving and, and saying okay here's the true history here's what's happening here's what was actually what actually wasn't contributed to but actually built this actually telling that true story and that true history makes the society better and so that's what it is because i give credit i give credit to the caucasian who settled this they were messing with the indians the africans the french the dutch uh the uh, mexicans and the spanish all at the same time all at the same time and pulled it off and settled it but the people who are here now are not the same because they sold it all off it's all sold off to china for some reason but anyway all right people so you know rest in the cosmos to uh, aretha franklin because from there she became and to there she returned and when you look up the word cosmos Cosmos is represented as an intellectual entity within itself that brings forth. That's God. A intellectual entity within itself that brings forth creation. That's God. And that's why I said back to the cosmos. I go beyond what 
the Caucasian has taught us about heaven and hell, and I say the cosmos. And what when you go out to the cosmos, what is the cosmos but beautiful blackness from which she became to where she returned? Okay. All right, so now we went to go see a movie today, you know, a little bit off the beacon path of what we usually see. You know, what's, what was that? Oh, okay. Let's have dinner. Okay. Um, all right. Um, we went off the beacon path. What's the name of the film? The Spy Who Dumped Me. Okay, The Spy Who Dumped Me. Tell her who, who stars in it again. Um, Mila Coolis and Kate McKinnon. And Mila Coolis, like, she's hilarious. So, if you see her in the film, nine times out of ten, or ten times out of ten, it's gonna be a good movie. You're gonna walk out of there happy. You're gonna find yourself laughing throughout the film. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we had to go see the film. Because when I saw that she was starring in it, I said, okay, I know it's gonna be hilarious. And you know, McKinnon is funny on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, she is. She's, She's funny the go to also. person yeah. for all of the various characters. Yeah. You know what I mean? So she, she's funny too. So we went to go see the movie. And at first, I, 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 I told my wife when I first saw the previews, and I'm going to be honest about this, I said, that's going to flop. I, I just looked at it. It's one of those things where in Hollywood, they'll keep giving the people, the actors, who it, 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 a black film could make billions, trillions of dollars, and they'll say, oh, well, you know, no more black movies for a while. But a Caucasian movie can fail and those actors will keep on getting chances. So when I looked at the trailer, I said, oh, this is going to flop. I said, it you looks know. funny. I said, look, it looks funny, but I said it was going to flop. So when we looked up the um, what it cost to make and what it actually made in the box office, it, made, it cost like $40 million yeah. to make and they only made... 21 point 21 point that is a dismal failure but guess what they will be back in the movies again but however let's talk about the film now all right so it's a comedy but it's based on it's comedy meets spy thriller and you're introduced to uh the main character uh, and then you're introduced to her boyfriend through flashbacks. Right, Justin Thoreau. That's right. You're, so, you know, they taught us in film school that if you're telling a linear piece, I love nonlinear pieces. Nonlinear means it's not by numbers, it's not, you know, you're introduced to the person, then they go through the training, then there's a hero's journey, blah, 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 blah. No, it switches up and then you have flashbacks. I, I love non-linear uh, creations and film. So that's the one, that's the first piece that made me say, hmm, I sat up in the seat in the theater and said, you know, this is, uh, this isn't bad. So you're introduced to the character. She's in her world. And then you're introduced, they tell you in film school, never to tell the story, tell the initiating event within a flashback. But in this story, it's told within a flashback, which is breaking the rules. I love it because in the Black Ice Chronicles, I break rules all the time. Okay, so you're introduced to her, then you're introduced to her boyfriend again through the flashback, and then you're introduced to her friend. Right. Right? Best friend. Best friend. And then the story goes on from there, and there is nudity in the film, and I didn't even get the rating on the film. But this, it might be a PG-13, but I don't know if it was an R, but let me tell you something. When you see the film, there is male nudity in this film, and it is a shocker, but at the same time, it makes you laugh the way that they shot it. So you should go see the film. Okay, so the film is a comedy and, uh, like I said, action, action. It's a comedy, action, thriller uh uh the, uh like that that's that's what it is and so there's plenty of action uh uh fight scenes right. within it gun play within it right. and it's uh amazing so the woman so the main character 
is a person who feels that she can't do anything right. She doesn't follow through. She doesn't follow through on anything. Right. Matter of fact, the the friend tells her that she doesn't even lie. She doesn't even lie. Right. That if when she lies, you just right. know that she's lying. Right. So the story tells the story of the hero's journey right. like that, but it's nonlinear, right. and she begins to arc in the film and by the end of the film she has transformed and and her best friend too has transformed into a totally uh new psychology of thought process and that's what we'll say the movie is entertaining it's funny action filled uh i'll say that it gives jason Bourne a run for his money and i'll say that it's up there with the fight sequences from Equalizer 1 and Equalizer 2. Would you say? The fight sequences. No, it's not as brutal, but the fight... I mean... Go ahead. I wouldn't put it up there with Equalizer 1 or Equalizer 2. Okay. But it's a hilarious film. The action is there. The fight scenes are great. So, and it's just hilarious. It's just like... There are scenes in the film where it's just like your mouth is open, like, what? I can't believe it. Yeah, I can't believe it. And then you're just laughing, and it's definitely worth going to see, and hopefully it'll pick up and do well in the box office because it is hilarious. Well, maybe it'll pick up and do better on Blu-ray. Right. And maybe, because once we can't, once the film finished, I sat there and said, you know what? This film was better than what I expected, and if it had done better at the box office, I could have seen them having a uh, franchise. Yeah, yeah. That's what they were trying to build yeah. was a, part a franchise. Part two would really be good. Yeah, part, part two. two. A part two would be good yeah. on the film. So it's uh, it's worth seeing. Uh, you will be entertained. And, you know, you will be entertained. I mean, it, it, that, that's, that's the best way to say it. Now, no, we have to talk about this. And we didn't, I didn't, when I typed it up, I didn't say that we were going to talk about it, but we're going to talk oh, about he this. He said, uh, Franklin said, super white women. He said, ha <laughs> ha, HBO. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's one of those films that you would say, because that's what I said when I first saw the preview. I said, oh, that's going to flop. That'll be one we'll see on HBO. Yeah, that's what I That's right. And then I did say that. We'll see that. Yeah, he on did HBO. say that. But then I said, and then. Then Trey said, "Well, let's go see something different. Let's yeah. just go see this, you know." Yeah. And so we went out to see because it. what else? Because I said I like Mila Kunis, right. and her movies are usually on point. So let's go see it. Right. Uh, I will say about the pacing of the film, about maybe three fourths into the film, coming into the last for the film, it starts to get into the doldrums a little bit. It starts to drag just a little and you like and it's like okay <coughs> at one point they really try to turn it into a spy thriller yeah. right i mean it, 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 they they so that's where and then all of a sudden yeah. many different variations of the story yeah. are told introducing yeah. new characters in and it gets a little yeah. muck uh murky in the middle and it slows down for a little bit but then after that, all films, some films that have great pacing, you never get that. But in this particular film, there was a doldrums period in the film where it just slowed down. Yep, and Franklin asked any black people in the film, yes. Uh, there was a character <laughs> in the film, a friend, a friend of hers. What did the friend say they grew up together? <laughs> she's a she's but a sapphire. She's, she's a sapphire. Though. Yeah, she, she's yeah. a sapphire. Yeah. I mean, she's she's the she's the sapphire, and um, you know, so she's a she's a, a stereotypical trope yeah. Yeah. within the film. So we'll say that you, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna get that in these films. But anyway, um, so overall, how what would you rate the film? Um, I would give it a. Give it an eight because it was just hilarious. It had me laughing. I, I gave it a seven because of the pacing. Right. I thought they really when when the editor got in there and when the director got in there in the editing bay, mm-hmm. 
they said this is so good they had the action sequences in the first one fourth two fourths of the film right. and they said let's really make this a a spy thriller an yeah. action thriller and i think that's where it slowed yeah. down but overall it's entertaining i give it a seven seven point five i gave it an eight because it is entertaining um and i love how the two stars you know are women and what i also like about the movie is you know, I, there were other black people in the film and diverse cast. So that's important to me, you know, because I think film should represent the real world. And the real world is a huge melting pot. So there's not just one kind of people. They had <laughs> so the it's Indian, very important. Yeah, it was an Indian. They had the man. Indian guy. He was from, uh, yeah. from uh, the Daily Show. Yeah, from the Daily Show. But he's yeah. also in, uh, what, what? in the movie, right? In the movie we saw a couple of weeks ago, um, okay. uh, Blind Spotting, right? Isn't that him? Was that him? Oh, yeah, that was. Oh, it's a different guy. Different guy. Okay, yeah. okay. Sorry. Yeah, but. Sorry to say. Oops, are we saying that all Indians well, look I like? Knew, no, I, I didn't know, say that. I knew it wasn't him. I know so, it wasn't. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but it's worth seeing and it's hilarious. Okay, so we, we didn't write this up, but we got to talk about this real quick. The Omarosa situation. You know, Omarosa appears to be putting it to Donald Trump and his family right now, releasing these uh, different tapes and backing up what she says. And she says, it's the art of the game, right. just like his book, right? right? Which she said, it's the art of the game, which makes people want to run out and then sell another million of his books to read what she's doing to him, which... I have two different viewpoints on this. I'm kind of split down the middle of it. I think, to me, she's a zeitgeist. And when it's time for her to go back into the White House, she will go back in. I, that, that's one side of it. I think that she's there because everyone who breaks away from Trump, they talk bad about him for a minute, but then they get on the TV shows and they get a show and then they're able to go on there and then they talk positively and whoop 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 right and for the people who are his supporters right. when she says certain things on the on on msnbc who looks like to me msnbc has gotten into a contract with her of some sort yeah. to me that's the way i look at it when they get on msnbc they say oh yeah see how smart he is because right. he's outsmarting the uh so-called quote-unquote politicians right. and so on one side She's spreading his message mm -hmm. still. Then I have another side that says that to me, she's always been self-serving. Right. And so she's self-serving for herself right now. Yeah, she's pushing her book. And she's pushing her book. But at the same time, because of what they did to her right. as a black person, not what they do to all black people, right. but what they did exactly. to her right. in particular, she says, oh, no. Right. I'm of a certain caliber of black person. You can do that to whomever else, but me, you shouldn't have done it to me. So I'm going to give it to you. And I recorded to show how nasty you are as... Because she said it was okay when you did it to Ray Ray and Pookie. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Or Jamal. Right. But or, you or not do that. You, you shall Omarosa. not do that to uh, okay. Omarosa. Now, I've been saying this and there's no aspersion, you know, uh, Bev, 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 DeVoe had the song Poison, and they and they say in the song, "Don't trust a big butt and a smile." No. Right? Now, Trump, Trump, to me, trusted a big butt and a smile because, listen, if a black woman who is definitely held the whole black community down, that no matter what what happens. The black woman is traditionally the one that holds the community down, could get into places that the black male couldn't get traditionally and has held it down through through everything that's held down. When that person, when that particular woman turns against her own community to push you, you should be very leery and apprehensive about bringing her into your inner circle because of the fact that if they turn on their own 
sooner or later, one day they will turn on you. And, and so, so that 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 that's very important to know because the black woman is the backbone. Now, she may feel that she is a strong black woman, but when when the issues came up and right. Trump was shown to be bigoted, Charlie Steele. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and initially not right. so much towards us, right. but towards other uh, right. people who call themselves minorities. We are a majority around the world, so we're pulled out of that because we have to have our own protective class because they took all that and gave that to other people who came into the country. But anyway, uh, you know, you can. We've talked about that before. Um, when a person doesn't speak up and, and and goes along with it, and she says that she was complicit, yeah, um, right? And now she's duplicit. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so <laughs> when, when that happens, you have to watch out for that. That is not to be trusted. When the person goes through, as we wrap up, right. as they go through the through line, and right. the through line goes back to, oh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have civil rights. We shouldn't do this we should just wait until they see our value when they have that and like i said at the beginning of this uh if people's black people who didn't believe in what martin luther king was doing had succeeded in that thought we wouldn't be sitting here today we would still be sharecropping okay. today and so uh when someone is like that you have to be very leery of them and not trust them whatsoever and the last point the last point of this She's been making a big deal. She's been bringing up these tropes back up again, which like, you know, we, we listened to a person, Tariq Nashi, and he started bringing back the the term coon. Mm -hmm. And you know, coon had died in the lexicon, but once you bring a word back, right. it stays in the lexicon for at least another hundred years. And so, you know, even though you're using it to distinguish between uh, a group of people who would sell you out versus people who are in the struggle, you know, that's still, in the, so it's in the lexicon, so people use it. But they're talking about the word and how Trump supposedly, there's this tape from the apprentice where he supposedly used the word. My question is this. Does it matter? Does it move us along? Does it hold us back any that a person who is now no longer just ignorant, but now would say uh, uh, exhibiting stupidity and dumbness? Does it matter if they use the word? If they use the word? Does it matter? Does it harm us any? If we know that the person is racist and they 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 exhibit okay let's back this up they exhibit racist actions uh their body language and their and what and their policies uh display and show that they're racist does them uh, whoever it is does that person using the n-word does that hurt us because their policies are already saying that they they think in they think the word anyway towards a group of people so their policies are saying that so does that hurt us that he said that will the estimated 26 percent of the black population that is about 15 to 16 percent of this population in this country right now because most people aren't taking the census you know but so there's about 15, 16 percent of the population, not notwithstanding the people who are also incarcerated, right? All right? Not not including them, it'd be even larger. But does that harm us any to for for that person to use the word? Will that 26 percent of the population that they say are going to vote for him this time is that going to stop them from voting for him? That's the question. No. And we're going to... <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So we're going to address that question on the next um, Nothing But The Facts podcast that's coming up uh, this Saturday. We'll be talking about that. So we're getting ready to close. So you've been watching this on the new Lordland Films page on Facebook. 
uh, make sure that you uh, like the Lordland Films page on uh, Facebook. It's at Lordland Films, but when you see the moniker, it's lordlandfilms.com. You've been seeing it on the Lordland Films page on uh, Facebook. Like the Lordland Films page on Facebook. Uh, Black Book TV is rolling. It is definitely a hodgepodge of the best uh, editing and the best uh, talk uh, video, you know, there's talk radio and then there's talk TV it is the best of talk TV that's out there. We have uh, nothing but the facts on there. Myself and Franklin G. We have this podcast, the film review with my wife and I. We have Brian Harris and Black Book Mondays on there. We have various <coughs> conscious interviews with James small, uh, uh, young Pharaoh, a la, uh, various, uh, other people. And the channel is rolling along and I am developing now black book hip hop where we're, uh, calling out <coughs> to the artists to send in their music videos. But unlike other shows, I am teaching people how to make sure that when they are in rotation, that they get credit. You know what I'm saying? I've always uh, uh, educated people. So we'll be talking about that in the future. Um, Bop TV. We're on Bop TV with Liv. Uh, Lordland Intellectual Vibe Electric Channel on Bop TV from out of Atlanta. And I'm calling out to all of the various people who have television stations internet uh, TV stations get with me we want to spread this signal as far as possible like when I talk to people about doing shows and and we, we contract and all that and we put contracts out we I already know what's already getting ready to happen and what's okay. happening because of the fact that you know anything that lordlandfilms.com does it does it's edited, finished, and it does come out. So we know that it actually happened. So stay tuned. We have more things coming. Um, we're here to make sure that our people are seen, heard, recognized, and appreciated. And I'm always getting the new cutting edge on equipment. We have invested in more equipment and I have to, uh, you know, take a moment to pat myself on the back because I'm programming a TV station, y'all. And, you know, anyone who knows about me is that I am methodical. I believe in the perfect, the perfection of perfect imperfection. So everything doesn't have to be totally correct, but to go from programming my channels on a YouTube Vimeo and all that and producing film to actually programming a television station and it's all written out as people begin to submit their shows the programming will get and we're definitely looking for great advertisers to come on because we have great product up already shout out to Brian Harris who is the Inter innovator and saying that this can be done and executing and putting the pieces together and that's what we do so um i just love y'all I, I, I love i love making sure my people are seeing her recognized and appreciate it i love it and i just you know got to give myself a, a pat on the back and a big woo because i am programming a television station that is on 18.6 k hemp digital antenna <coughs> cut the coaxial of cable and watch yourself shout out to all the people who are involved who are in front of the camera and the people who work with me behind the camera shout out definitely to my wife who is always the biggest uh supporter of me and uh she counsels me on things and helps me keep my head when people act crazy as 
so. all get out and that's what keeps me sane is crazy deep so stay tuned for that lordlandfilms.com and i told you all the rest subscribe to lordland films on uh facebook and youtube and crazy on dion on youtube and we'll be back um soon soon soon